we present the six mothers-in-law of Henry VIII, an unreliable history created and written by Barry Grossman. King Henry VIII is getting a little older, and with age the realisation that he is also getting a little lonely. He does not believe he has had the best of fortune in selecting his wives, with good reason, though it must be said he has brought some of his troubles on himself. He has summoned his adviser, Thomas Cromwell, not to talk of affairs of state, but rather to discuss matters of the heart. I have been unlucky in marriage, Cromwell. Indeed, sire. Five times wed? Quite so, sire. The fortunate man marries only once. You're right. A man who's miserable with only one woman doesn't know how lucky he is. But me? Three of my wives have died? Well, you executed two of them. I had no choice. Treasonous pair of vipers. And the others... One was as barren as a clay pit. She gave birth to your daughter, sire. A daughter? A king needs a daughter like a eunuch needs a jockstrap. Your fourth wife was a kind and gentle woman. And the ugliest woman in Europe, forsooth. Apart from Wilhelmina, the wart-covered witch of Wimbledon. Oh. Actually, I always quite fancied her. Am I to take it from your earlier soul-searching, sire, that your marrying days are over? Well, I don't know. I've married for beauty. I've married for the sake of my country. I've married to have a son. What else is left? Love, sire? I always married for love, Cromwell. <clears throat> well, nearly always. Perhaps I did kind of forget about love along the way. Sometimes. But you're right. I must marry for love. I will. Marry for love. Well said, sire. Cromwell, find me a woman to fall in love with. Oh, I'm not sure it works that way. One simply has to let Cupid do his work. How does that happen, then? Perhaps your trouble is that you meet the same old people all the time. You need to look outside the court. Like where? Well, for you, it's not easy. Being king, you can't just drop into a tavern... Yes, but do I always have to be king? Sire? Perhaps I shall disguise myself as a commoner and go and mingle with the people in the taverns. Oh, oh, I'm not sure about that, sire. But that way I can meet a nice, normal woman and perhaps fall in love with her. Well, I suppose it might work. You know about this sort of thing, Cromwell? Which are the best local drinking establishments? Uh, the Queen's Head? No, no, perhaps not. There's a good tavern in the village hmm? run by a Mrs. Parr and her daughter. Quite upmarket, I believe. Right. Look me out my tattiest ermine robe, Cromwell. It's dress down Friday. Well, the King and Cromwell certainly seem to be having a good long chat. No doubt arranging a few revelries, or even discussing available princesses. Hello? No, this is a sight I don't often see. Right under my window, the king, leaving the palace on his own, and dressed in the most workaday clothes, virtually in disguise, in fact. Oh, well, Friday again. Ravening whore to be here soon, demanding drink. Well, don't knock it, dear. They put a roof over our head and dinner on the table. Yes. Why is it we only get roofers and waiters in here? I don't know. Now, everything ready? Oh, I think so. Check the toilets. Oh, God, I haven't even dug them yet. Right, you do that, and I'll do a sign advertising our widescreen viewing entertainment experience. What's that, then? Looking out the window. Oh, right, well, that should catch on. I'll see you in a while. Where's my shovel? Oh, sorry, uh, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, good day, um, my good woman. <laughs> A glass of your finest ale, if you please, on this fine spring morning. <laughs> now there's a real gentleman talking. Is it? 
Well, what do people usually say in a place like this? Well, usually it's a tuppenny jug, love, and show us yours while you're at it. Really? Of course, that's only the more cultured ones. I see. So, not a big tavern goer, are you? I've led a rather sheltered life, you might say. Oh, have you, love? And what brings you out into the big wide world? I want a woman. Oh, come straight to the point, why don't you? Well, Peggy will be in later. She'll seat you around the back for a farthing. Maybe nothing if she's drunk. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm not looking for gratuitous, meaningless sex with a woman I've barely met. Oh, sure. No, I can get all that at home. I'm looking for love. Oh, now that's what I call a proper gentleman. Well, I'm sure there are one or two eligible young ladies around. Excellent. In fact, my daughter Catherine will be in in a minute. She's just out the back digging a lamp. Uh, uh, lavender bush. Just digging a lavender bush into the garden. Ah, the lavender bush. Such a pretty plant. Oh, I like a man with an appreciation of nature. I think my Catherine could be just the girl for you. Do you now? Though I do have to tell you, she's been married before. Has she? Twice. Really? Yes, I know that must seem a bit excessive. Well, <laughs> these things happen from time to time, I suppose. But she has had two very fine husbands. Is that so? Well, I wouldn't want my Catherine going off with any man. No offence, but you'd have to be able to keep her in the style to which she's accustomed. Well, I am not without means. Really? Suffice to say that were she to become my wife, she would have gardens enough for as many lavender bushes as she could wish for. Oh, landed as well as cultured. Catherine! Catherine, dear, put down your trowel for a moment and come in here. There's somebody I'd like you to meet. What did you say your name was? My name? Oh, um... Henry, um, Henry Castle. Well, Mr Castle, here's that glass of best ale you wanted. Uh, haven't I seen you somewhere before? No, I don't think so. Right, that'll be a halfpenny. A halfpenny? Sorry, that's inflation for you. Now, I'm sure you're looking forward to meeting my... Catherine, come in here, dear! All right, I'm coming! Oh, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, well, I'll just pop out the back and uh, let you two have a chat. <laughs> <laughs> See you later, Mr Castle. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, haven't I seen you before somewhere? Uh, no, I don't think so. Oh, excuse my dirty hands. I've been digging. Um, yes, your mother was telling me. Oh, well, it's not the most glamorous job, but it has to be done. Nonsense. It'll be beautiful once the fruits of your labours are there for all to see. Eh? The colours, the scent. Well, you're a rum and no mistake. Still, you're quite cute in a well-upholstered sort of way. Well-upholstered? You're fat. What? Well, I can't be the first person to have told you. Well, you're, you're the first person to put it quite as plainly. Others fiddle-faddle around with... Portly and full of figure. Never mind. Girls quite like something on a man they can grab hold of. Piles of his money, preferably. You know, in all my years, no one has been honest enough to stand in front of me and say, You, uh, Henry Castle, are fat. <laughs> I find that very refreshing. Well, I speak as I find. It's how I was brought up. My mum's the same. And what if I were, by some amazing happenstance, to be transformed into a great, important man? Would you still speak as you find? Oh, yes. Even if you're really, really important. Even if you own that whole field out there. I've never met anyone quite like you before, Catherine. Haven't you? I don't suppose you'd like to come for dinner at my place. Oh, that sounds nice. <laughs> then I shall meet you here at six o'clock tomorrow and escort you to my abode. I hope you will do me the honour of wearing your finest gown. Right you are, Henry. Posh frock it is. <laughs> I shall look forward to it. Now, how about taking me out the back and showing me your lavender bush? Oh, saucy devil. I must insist, sire, this dressing up as a commoner business is going too far. I'm going to collect Catherine and bring her here for dinner. What's wrong with that? I don't like it. It's not right, the king mixing with a common tavern keeper. Cromwell, Catherine and her mother are women of business. Their tavern affords them a healthy living. Do you know that their beer's a halfpenny a glass? Well, that's just southern prices. What do you mean? Up north for a halfpenny, they'd throw in a meat pie, and if you're lucky, a tumble with the barmaid. Really? Oh. 
Oh, oh, a meat pie, eh? (laughs) Although, owing to some financial difficulties I have at the moment... We really must go to the North more often. Even a halfpenny would be more than I could comfortably lay my hands Mm, on. I could just go a meat pie now. I rather urgently need a benefactor who could advance me £10,000. You know, Cromwell, I believe I may be in love with Catherine. What? But... (laughs) only met her once. Well, she's different from anyone I've ever met before. She doesn't bow and scrape. She treats me as an equal. Of course she treats you as an equal. She doesn't know who you are. But it's so refreshing. Do you know she told me I was fat. Oh, disgraceful. It's not disgraceful. I am fat. Look at me. I'm rolling in fat. I've got more fat than a roasting pan that's just cooked the fattest pig on Fatty Pig Farm. Tell me I'm fat, Cromwell. Perhaps a slight tendency to lack of leanness. Fat. Fat, fat, fat. Say I am fat. A little excess here and there. Middle age spread. You see, you can't do it. You're so used to kowtowing and touching your forelock, you cannot tell me the truth. You place me in a difficult position. You're supposed to be my chief advisor, yet you cannot advise me of this most basic thing, my own shape. No, I shall entertain Catherine tomorrow, and I may very well ask her to marry me. I do advise against it, sire. Cromwell, I shall woo the lady, and I shall win her. I don't need your advice in matters of love. As you wish, sire. I do wish. Oh, um, Cromwell. Sire? Do you think I should give her garter a twang before dinner or after? Hmm? Whoever would have thought it? Rumour has it that the king is smitten with an innkeeper's daughter. Could he at last be about to find true happiness? Mother, I'll be fine with Mr Castle. We're only going to have dinner, that's all. Well, maybe you are, love, but all I'm saying is I asked around in the town today and nobody had even heard of him. Well, he works at the palace, doesn't he? probably lives in. When he picks you up tonight, I'm going to follow on old Dobbin. (gasps) Oh, no, hang on. Old Dobbin asked for the night off. I'll take the horse instead. Oh, Mother, don't you dare. I shall keep a low profile. Look, I'm going off with a man I met yesterday. He's taking me to his house. He'll probably give me some wine. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? Perhaps I better keep a high profile. The King has formed a new relationship. And all of us at court are agog to see his latest young lady. Indeed, I can see a couple coming into the grounds now. One looks very like the king, but I'm not sure. And there's a third party. Who can that be? Oh, feeding eyesight is very inconvenient for a chronicler. You don't mind my mother coming along, do you, Henry? It's just she does worry about me. Not at all. Never actually been in a palace before. Oh, it's nothing special once you get used to it. What did you say you actually do here? (laughs) This and that. You know, now I look at you, you do rather resemble the king. Do I? Though you're a bit fatter. Am I? And much nicer. In what way nicer? Well, you're kind and polite and gentle, whereas the king is a horrible power-crazing human brute. Is this how the people think of the king? Well, what do you think of him? Well, I... I believe he could be misunderstood. When a man tells you he's going to have your head chopped off, what's to misunderstand? Catherine, my dear, I have something I must tell you. Yes, Henry? I have not been completely truthful with you. I knew it. He's only interested in one thing. Did you put on those 16 underskirts like I told you? Mother, let the man speak. Thank you, Catherine. Now, tell me, have you ever actually seen the king? Not in the flesh, only portraits. And you say I look fatter than the king in his portraits? Definitely. And may I hazard a guess, less handsome? Mm, Honestly? Ah, these portrait painters are the same as everyone else, presenting me in too favourable a light. Bow and scrape, bow and scrape. How do you mean they present you in too favourable a light? And what's all this about you not being honest with Catherine? Catherine, madam, you must prepare yourself for a shock, for there stands before you none other than your sovereign king. Where? Here, me. I am he. Henry VIII. Don't be so daft. How much wine have you had? (sighs) Well, look, I'll prove it to you. Uh, You boy, come here. Sire? Who am I? You're His Majesty King Henry, sire. No, 
You've set that up. Uh, yeah, you, servant, come here. Page boy, and you. All of you, come in here. Oh, uh, master of the king's music, yeah, come here. Astronomer Royal, you as well. How fortunate that you all happen to be passing. Right, once and for all, who am I? You, you are, are His Majesty, Majesty King Henry, sire. Now do you believe me? I... I suppose so. Hallelujah. Right, you can all go. Oh, forgive us, Your Majesty. What do you mean, us? I'm not the one who accused the King of being a sex-mad lecher. Forgive her, Your Majesty. You are forgiven. Now, would you please leave us for a moment? Yes, Your Majesty. I'm sorry, Your Majesty. Well, I don't know what to say. Say only this, my dear, that you will be my bride. Henry. I know we haven't known each other long, but I have an instinct for these things. That most of your wives have ended up divorced or beheaded. OK, I haven't got an instinct for these things, but you're different. I know you are. It'll work. I can feel it in my bones. You think so? I suppose it might be my gout. But marry me, Catherine, and be my queen. So... You've beheaded two of your wives, one died under her own steam, and you've divorced the other two. Yes. Oh, you're on. What's the worst that can happen, eh? Uh, shall we have the do here or in the tavern? My people, my wife and I would like to thank you for joining us in the celebration of our marriage. I know how much you all look forward to a royal wedding, which is why I try to have as many as possible. <laughs> and that my track record may not be the best, but I can honestly say that Catherine and I are very much in love, and I have no plans to behead her whatsoever. <laughs> I'm also delighted to have been told that the song which I have written is number one in the charts for the 128th consecutive week. And I'm sure when someone writes another song, that'll go straight in at number two. So, if the Queen will join me, I suggest that we all boogie on down. Music, menial, police. And so the king looked forward, as he had so many times before, to a long and happy married life. But Catherine and her mother were not content to see him sit around the palace, with servants to do everything from wipe his nose to trim his toenails. They prepared a vigorous program of physical activity for him in an attempt to trim some of the excess weight from the royal figure. Cromwell, meanwhile, is still seeking to alleviate the financial embarrassment he mentioned to the king some little time ago. Come in! Good morning, Mrs. Park. Ah, Master Cromwell, isn't it? Indeed. You are settling into palace life, I trust? Well, it's not unlike a pub, really. Lots of people gossiping away in all the little corners. Quite so. Your tavern was quite a substantial business concern, I believe. Oh, yes. We could take two or three pounds some nights. As the King's Chancellor, part of my duties is to advise members of the royal family, like yourself, oh. on matters of finance, such as uh, investment. Mm? May I inquire as to where you have your savings at present? Well, you know old Maisie Grumfit lives in the old tumble-down cottage in the woods? I'm afraid I haven't had the pleasure. Well, her husband Nigel's an investment banker. He looks after my money. I see. Have you ever thought of going into the uh, stock market? Oh, a bit dangerous, isn't it? Not at all. My friend Sir Gerald Hurdy is building some new houses. Shares in his company are set to rocket. Where's he building them? Oxford Street. Oxford Street? Well, who's going to live away out there? Oh, the outer suburbs are getting very popular. No noise, no traffic. Honestly, be no green belt left soon. Can I put you down for 10,000? 10,000? Oh, that's my life savings. Well, 
Now's your chance to increase them. The price won't stay low for long. Yes. Well, they do say invest in property, don't they? Go on, then. If you can't trust the Chancellor, who can you trust? And stroke! And stroke! And stroke! Well, Mother, you've got poor Henry working harder than he ever has in his life. It's for his own good. He needs to lose a couple of stones. True. He has to learn that getting rid of a few pounds of ugly fat doesn't mean beheading his wife. I wonder if we should get him interested in falconry. Oh, that won't help him much. The bird does all the work. Yes. Oh, looks like they've finished the rowing. <gasps> I must go and congratulate him. Going, Henry! Good morning, madam. Oh, good morning, Master Cromwell. I fear you may be exhausting the king. Well, Catherine and I have only his welfare at heart. I mean this uh, rowing. Look, she has him carrying the boat to the boathouse. It's quite normal to carry the boat to the boathouse. Yes, but don't the other oarsmen usually get out first? Oh, nonsense. A little exercise never did anyone any harm. In fact, I am of the opinion that the king will also be having to prove his fitness in another department on a regular basis. In his younger days, he would have liked nothing better. But kings and paupers alike must bend the knee to all conquering time. Catherine is still a relatively young woman. She still has her needs, her desires, her physical... Yes, 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 we, we get the picture. I pray you, madam, be a little less zealous in your pursuit of the king's health. I fear the strain of being so fit will kill him. Here you are, Mother. The new sheets have arrived. Oh, good. Time for a good old read of the gossip. Actually, let me have a look at the financial pages. Oh, I thought Mr Grumfit took care of all that for you. Oh, not anymore. Master Cromwell put me on to investing in some property shares. Now, where are we? Ah... Sir Gerald Hurdy's speculation in outlying Oxford Street has proved to be a spectacular failure. Oh, my God! Mother, you've gone pale. Oh, I invested all our savings in this. What? All work on the project was stopped when the workmen began turning up human bones. Oh, my Lord! The large number of bones that were found and the obviously swift nature of their burial in quicklime could mean only one thing. A plague pit! Oh, my God! The place must be crawling with disease. No one will live there now. No! Not even students. Oh, Mother! What are we going to do? Wait, there's more! Among those who were thought to have unloaded their now worthless shares before the news became public were certain friends of Sir Gerald, including Thomas Cromwell. Mother, you've been done. Oh, I've been done, all right. But we pals didn't get to be the leading innkeepers in Surrey by getting done. I think we're going to have to prepare a little surprise for Master Cromwell. If Mistress Parr's appearance was anything to go by when I saw her this morning, I would guess that she is not well pleased. Though whatever the cause, it pales into insignificance compared to the sad news I have to report. Our beloved king has fallen gravely ill. This way, Your Majesty. Not long now. This is not a part of the palace with which I am familiar. I assure you, you will learn something of great interest. Oh, slower, I pray you. I'm weak. Just along this corridor. The battle for the succession was already started, with the king's children making claim and counterclaim. Intrigue is rife. You may see small groups of courtiers huddled together in dark corners. Why, only this morning I saw the Duke of Northumberland. <coughs> Your Majesty, Mistress Parr. So, this is where you exist, is it? 
I have often wondered, always hanging around, scribbling away all hours of the day. Well, I am the chronicler, Your Majesty. I record all the doings of the court that future generations might know of your magnificent reign. Mm. And one person whose doings you have recorded in some detail, I believe, is Master Cromwell? But as the King's Chancellor, he has indeed figured largely in my writings, yes. Show the King, pray, your file on Cromwell. Please, mistress... A chronicler must protect his sources. Executioner! All right, all right. You see? Look here, Your Majesty. Mm. He happily saw your second wife, Anne Boleyn, go to the block purely to get rid of his rival, Crumb. Oh, my God, I knew he was a rogue, but... Your fourth wife, huh? Anne of Cleves, that portrait... All set up by Cromwell for his personal gain. I had my suspicions. And as for poor Catherine Howard, look! Who orchestrated that whole sorry chain of events that led to her execution? None other than your trusted friend, Master Cromwell. Treason! Chronicler, take up your pen and chronicle this. Death warrant of Thomas Cromwell. Hang on, sire. I, I've got a pre-printed form somewhere. Uh, proclamations, uh, declarations of war, ah, uh, death warrants. Fill it out. Yeah, excuse me, Your Majesty. And so, as almost the last act of his long and eventful life, the king condemns Cromwell to death. Catherine and her mother are, I know, well provided for in the king's will and will soon recoup Mrs. Parr's losses. Thus we can now close our chronicle of Henry VIII, his six wives and his six mothers-in-law. Who's he talking to? I don't know. Between you and me, I think he's getting a bit past it. <laughs> That was the final program of the six mothers-in-law of Henry VIII, created and written by Barry Grossman. With Jonathan Coy as Henry VIII, Rachel Atkins as Catherine Parr, and Sally Grace as mother. Also featuring Milton Johns as Thomas Cromwell. The Chronicler was played by Alfred Burke, the music was written by Jim Parker and the programme was produced by John Fawcett Wilson.